This is the Gospel Feast Series for those who want a little meat after their milk. We've been discussing the book of Daniel, called the most important book in the Bible in terms of proving the divinity of Jesus Christ. And I'm here with author and scholar Reed Simonson. And in this episode, I was hoping we could explore Daniel's famous dream of the four beasts. Let's do. It's really an important dream. But I think before we do that, I think what's really important to understand, and it's a scripture that's dear to the heart of every Latter-day Saint, is Amos 3.7. I've used that many times in meetings and discussions. It goes like this, as you know. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. I think if we were to use less King James English, we could say very clearly that what this says is, is that know this truth. The Lord never does anything without first telling his prophets that he is going to do it. You know, that is actually wonderfully reassuring. There's so much of the world that is shrouded in confusion and mystery, and I think some of that's even been in secular religions, has fallen into their understanding of God, is that they don't understand what he's doing and why he's doing it. Oh, I agree. And in fact, it really should bring us peace, because it says literally that God will not surprise his children with wonders or miracles or judgments or anything, or even his second coming before he has told his prophet. Now here's the catch. If you don't have a prophet, Ah. where are you going to know this? (laughs) Yes, and hence the need for continuing revelation and continuing representation from heaven in the form of a living prophet. Yes, God says he will not do anything without telling it first to his prophet and we've got some events coming, means that there better be a prophet somewhere or God is a liar. And I doubt the latter is the case, so we've got to go with the former. There must be a living prophet on the earth. There must be a living prophet on the earth. And then there's one other thing I think is useful before we jump into the dreams to understand. There is an amazing correlation in the scriptures between this idea of foretelling his mysteries, his knowledge, what he's going to do to his prophet, and the idea of being beloved. Ah, we know a few apostles and prophets that have been called beloved, but you're saying this is almost like a distinction or a title? It's absolutely so consistent that you can't ignore it. Mm. For example, one of the most famous books of Revelation, the one that's actually called the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ, people usually forget that's the second part. They call it the book of Revelation. Leave off the important part. Or they call it John's Revelation, and that's true but the book is actually the revelation of Jesus Christ as given to John. But it's given to John the Beloved. Isn't that interesting? No, that's very interesting. Now, Daniel is called much loved or beloved in his book, and he's another one that is given revelation, knowledge. In fact, people argue that Daniel's book is really the Old Testament's revelation, and the book of Revelation is really the New Testament Daniel. They're both books of Revelation given to beloved prophets. No, that is fascinating. There's another one. In the Book of Mormon, Nephi, who is given a great vision, is called much loved or beloved too. So with that, with these three different prophets being called beloved or much loved, are you saying that there is a correlation then to what privileges or how they are treated by the Lord? I am. I guess what I'm saying is, if you understand the symbolism that the Lord wants to have an intimate experience with us, the church has been called the bride of Christ, and we're called the the children of God and the family of God. There's this idea in the symbolism that God wants to have you be as close to him as a spouse and a beloved spouse, and even as a dear friend, if you want to go with the friends. What I really love, there's a beautiful passage in the Doctrine and Covenants, too, that after the saints in these latter days had been actively helping the Lord with his needs, Mm. there's some early threats sort of at the beginning where he's kind of trying to get their attention. There's some things I need you to do. There's some things I need you to take seriously. And as they started doing that, his tone softens a little because he saw they were actually doing what he said. And, you know, we know that the poor Lord during his mortal ministry didn't get a lot of people doing what he said, you know? Uh, Yes. (laughs) So listen to this thing that he said to Joseph Smith in regards to the church. It's in Doctrine and Covenants 93, and it starts at verse 45, and I'll truncate it a little, but you can look it up if you want to. Yes. He says, Verily I say unto my servant Joseph Smith, Jr., and then he lists other saints of that time, 
I will call you friends, for you are my friends, and ye shall have an inheritance with me. That is quite the honor to be called a friend of God. It's wonderful. And then, of course, we can't leave it there. We have to also note that it was through Jesus Christ that the Father revealed his secrets, his will, and his mystery. And, of course, you know his favorite title for Jesus. This is my beloved son. There's a connection between being much loved and being given the information, the secrets, the knowledge, the revelation, and the future events from heaven. And then also on a personal level, how many times have saints and good people had the Holy Ghost whisper to them events and warnings and things that they should know? That should give them comfort because yes. the Lord gives those things to the people that he loves. It doesn't mean you're perfect. We all have our issues. You don't have to be necessarily as put together as Daniel is. But if you in your life have had the Holy Ghost whisper to you, speak to you, give you revelation, teach you things, it's a mark of God's friendship and kindness and love for you and his desire to be intimate and to commune with you on a level more than just, I am God and you are servant and bow down. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. It is beautiful. So, let's get into it, huh? Yes. Nebuchadnezzar had been dead about 10 years. And we're not certain if the person on the throne at this time was actually Nebuchadnezzar's son or grandson. It is a little confusing in the records. But what I find rather interesting is that his name was Belshazzar. Mm. And you'll remember that Daniel's Babylonian name was... Uh, it was very similar. It was uh, Belshazzar. Belshazzar. So there's a tuh sound in there. And we know from the records that Nebuchadnezzar was very interested in having Daniel be his heir. He would have given Daniel the kingdom if Daniel wanted it. And he actually tried several times. And Daniel said, no, I don't want to be the king of Babylon. I'm a prince of Judah, and my job is with my people. And Nebuchadnezzar loved him. And particularly after Nebuchadnezzar's conversion and his forgiveness and his redemption, because you remember that he wrote a scripture. He wrote he his conversion in the Bible. It's in there. You can read it. He died full in the faith. Now his heir and his queens, I don't think really knew what to do with this. You'd hope that now that he had lost his narcissism, they would have <laughs> discovered the change and been more interested, but they apparently were not. But I find it fascinating that Nebuchadnezzar's heir at this time is named Belshazzar. And I just suspect, but it's just my opinion, that this boy may have been named after Daniel's Babylonian name. Wow. I think it shows you the great honor Nebuchadnezzar held for Daniel. If he couldn't have Daniel, he would have somebody named after Daniel At sitting least. on the throne. But that could be incorrect. Now, this particular Belshazzar is about one year away from being assassinated when this happens. Okay, so the Lord gives Daniel a new dream, and he has to, because he has to be true to the promise of Amos. He was about to do something. And so he had to warn his prophet. That's correct. So this shows Amos is correct. So one night, Daniel has this dream. And in this dream, he sees beasts coming out of the ocean. First one is a lion with wings. And it's quite a beast. But after a while, the lion's wings are clipped. And the lion is made to stand up as a man. And a human heart is given to it. And then that one passes away. Another beast comes out of the ocean. And this one is a bear. And it's got three ribs in and out of its mouth. So and it's a, just sort of gnawing on what was formerly someone's ribs. Yes, it was. Someone's corpse of ribs. You know, we all like ribs, right? I do like a bit of Yeah, me too. So he's gnawing on these ribs. And a voice says, devour much flesh. Ooh. And he has a period of time where he devours and then he also passes away. Then another beast comes out of the ocean. And this one is a four-headed leopard it ends up having a period of time. It passes away. And then Daniel is most frightened by the last beast he sees. It's kind of a dragon dinosaur thing. And it's like got these iron teeth and these 10 horrible horns. And it just tramples and destroys everything. And it's really quite ferocious. It ends up having a period of time. And then it too passes away. Well, Daniel wakes up from the stream and he is deeply disturbed. Well, I would be too. Um, as Many people have read the Bible, and this is why I think a lot of people struggle with it. They read and struggle often through some of these passages, and they try to envision and, and try to make sense of these, these things. And, well, as we were talking about in a previous episode, the need to think in Eastern terms. 
And we get so caught up on how many horns did it have and, and what was the color of the ribs it was gnawing on when that really isn't the point. And that's what I'm hoping you're about to tell me. <laughs> well, I appreciate you thinking easterly. I'm trying. You are. In the case of the horns, and we'll get to that, the ten number 10 is important. But the fact that you are striving to feel the symbols and, and let them function on you emotionally really is more important in some respects. Although in this particular case, some of the numbers do have meaning. Let's find out how Daniel found this out. Oh, okay, yes, because uh, that's in there too. He was disturbed by the dream, and then he does what any good servant of the Lord should do is he... Well, Joseph Smith made a statement. He said that whenever the Lord gives a dream or any kind of vision or parable that deals with symbolism, he holds himself accountable for answering the symbol's meaning. That's huge. Well, and that's very appreciative. I, I know there's so many times that, unfortunately, there's a concept that we hold here in the U.S., which is you are held accountable to laws even if you don't know they exist. Oh, well said. And so the Lord doesn't treat us that way. Is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying. And that he is willing and able to explain himself, but you have to ask him. And that's the catch. Most people will have an experience and they'll sit back and they'll go, whoa, this was really an experience. But they won't go to the Lord and then say, I don't understand, teach me. Because he will teach you if you ask, but you have to ask. That's the catch. And this is a thing Nebuchadnezzar didn't do. If you'll remember Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he woke up and said, get the wise men in here and they better figure this out or everybody's dead. That's right. And Daniel instead- Did it the proper way. <laughs> he went to the Lord and said, this dream came from you, what does it mean? Now, you'd think that Daniel, having been through this a few times, would basically do that. But that's not Daniel. Daniel is an astounding person, and we can learn a lot from him. Instead of just going right to the Lord and saying, okay, you gave me a crazy dream, and you've promised to explain your crazy dream, so here, hurry up. Can't so you... I demand an answer. Yeah, no. he did not do that. Instead, and the scriptures tell us his preparation model, the first thing he did is he fasted. And in some cases, it was for several days. We have one case later we're going to bump into where it was actually like three weeks. Oh, my goodness. Now, in, in ancient times, too, they didn't always, when they fasted, have no water. A yeah, lot of you can't really go three weeks without having water. No, and, and I know that kind of in our current system, we say, you know, no food, no water, 24 hours. Okay, fine. But a lot of the ancients, when they would fast for a period of time, they would have some water but wouldn't eat anything. Anyway, he fasted and then he prayed. And in his prayer, it's very interesting when you study his prayer. We have, again, an example. I don't know that this exact example pertains to this exact dream, but it's not the point. The point is we do have his pattern, and I'm mm. sure he used it repeatedly. He knelt down and he prayed and he confessed his sins before the Lord. And then after that, he confessed the sins of his own people. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, so he had taken on himself at that point the stewardship, the mantle of leading his people. Well, he was the highest civil prince mm. of any power in Babylon. He was not the heir to the throne, although by the time Nebuchadnezzar got done killing all the heirs to the throne, Daniel might have been the heir to the throne. That's not impossible. But he was definitely a royal prince. And he was by far the highest leading representative of Judah in so Babylon. He definitely took upon himself their, the responsibility of his people. He did. And he confessed their sins. And he explained to the Lord that he understood that the Lord was righteous. And that in the terms of history of what had happened to Judah and Israel, because Israel had been taken away prior to this time, mm -hmm. he told the Lord that he understood that the Lord had been wronged by the people that the Lord had tried everything he could to help Israel up until the time that he took them away. Daniel was beloved. And so the Lord and he had had many intimate discussions, or at least certainly the ones that we have recorded. And he understood the Lord's thinking and sorrow over having lost Israel to the Assyrians and now having lost Judah, Levi, and Benjamin to Babylon. He understood this was really hard on the Lord and it hurt him. And then he went on to remind him, and this is interesting because we know from other prophets that the Lord really likes it when we remind him of his promises. Hmm. We would think it would be something like, oh gosh, you know, you're sticking it in my face. You know, you said I could borrow the car, dad, if I washed the, you know, that kind of stuff. And the Lord doesn't see it that way at all. He sees it that you know my word. Well, and then it's more of a humility of that we did listen. In this case, that Daniel did listen. 
he did know what was promised and he was not in a sense of pride with the, the borrowing the car example, but with a sense of humility saying, I have fulfilled what you asked because you promised you would do these well, things. Well, what it shows is that, that he knows that the Lord is faithful. So he's saying, you've made promises to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob and, in, and certainly Joseph of Egypt. You made promises to Moses and Aaron and you made promises to David. I believe you'll keep them. Mm. I believe that you will keep your promises. And he loves it because it shows that you know his word and that you trust him to be a God of his word. And he listens to that. So it's an interesting thing to note. When you have a need and you have your patriarchal blessing or you know the scriptures and you go to the Lord and you say, I need your help. You promised me you would help me with this. And I believe you will help me. He likes that. So Daniel does that in his pattern. And then he had also confessed to the Lord that he knew that the Lord had been a protective husband and a nurturing husband, and that he had also promised to forgive his people when they came to him in repentance. And so Daniel, in a rather vicarious way, was not only repenting of his own sins, but he was saying, I'm repenting as the chief leader on behalf of the people too, as far as I can. And God heard it. And so sure enough, he answered the questions and the symbolism to this dream. So we know the answer. This is basically what he said. Let's he, hear it. He told Daniel that this dream of the four beasts was actually the exact same dream he had given Nebuchadnezzar. That's the dream of the golden idol. Yes. Well, but the head, was, only the head was gold. And then we had this, the silver chest and the bronze a torso and the legs of iron and then the weak feet that was both iron and clay it was mixed together yes and so we can line up that's five things but it's really kind of four when you realize that nebuchadnezzar understood that the legs and feet were connected it was like part one and part two of the same thing yes so when you know that and you line these dreams up they do line up really well in fact the first beast that came out of the ocean and we should stop and say that in ancient symbolism the ocean is connected to lucifer and is always the symbol of the world of the dead or of death and hell. So we can talk about that more specifically at another time. But in Eastern thinking, the ocean is death and the land is life. So whenever you have a beast or anything coming out of the ocean, it's coming from Satan. That's a, a key to use as we're reading the scriptures every time we see those references. Oh, you'll see it all over the place, this connection. So these four beasts come from Satan. Okay. And the first one is the lion, and the lion is Nebuchadnezzar. And it's interesting because this lion comes out with wings. I mean, a lion with wings. Oh, it would be terrible. I mean, how would you deal with a lion that can fly? Well, that's the eastern part as you think about it. That is a frightening thing. And that this lion had his wings clipped, and he became a man, and his beast heart was taken, and he stood up and became a man, and had his period of rulingship and then passed on. And that's exactly what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel witnessed it. Nebuchadnezzar was a lion. And the Lord ripped out his lion heart and he made him into a man. And he ended up ending his days better than he began them. After Nebuchadnezzar was gone, the next kingdom on the rise is going to be Medo-Persia. Mm. This is the one that the dream was given for because Daniel is just about to see Persia take over Babylon. And so the Lord is indeed doing another wonder and he's going to tell his prophet. So that is the bear. And the bear was like the shoulders, very, very strong. And he had these ribs in his mouth. And Medio Persia took over the world and caused all kinds of trouble. And then eventually that kingdom passed away when Alexander the Great rose. And he was the leopard. And that's very interesting, too. We'll have to talk about leopards later. But uh, leopards are connected to Mahonism and are connected to Luciferianism. And, oh, that's very interesting. Yes. And in fact, the royal priests of those orders used to wear leopard robes. We'll talk about leopard in terms of Luciferian symbolism at another time. But this particular leopard had four heads. And history does show that the Greeks took over under Alexander, conquered the world. And the kingdom broke up into four parts. It did. Alexander died, and his four generals took over and divided the world into four. And that's exactly what happened. Now, the last beast was this lizard or dinosaur or dragon. It's this monster that comes out of the ocean. Terrible jaws. This is Rome, which is also the iron legs. Now, what is so fascinating, there are ten horns on this dragon... And the feet had ten, ten toes. The symbology holds. 
it works. And when Rome fell, Rome did fall into basically 10 parts. And historians debate those 10 parts. Some of them actually see them as the 10 tribes of Japheth and those that were in the area. And there really were 10. Or they see it also as the 10 districts. It doesn't really matter. But that this terrible beast did a lot of damage and then sort of fell into a second incarnation. And it would be that incarnation that the great stone cut without hands would strike. And indeed, the church was restored when Rome in its broken state still ruled. So we have dreams seen by Nebuchadnezzar, and the interpretation is gotten uh, by a man of humility who besought the Lord for it. And then again, we have the different dream, but with the same interpretation. But this time it was more for the beloved, for Daniel. Well, I appreciate you saying that, because certainly Nebuchadnezzar's version was manly, and it was an idol, and it was almost like this false pagan god. And yet from God's perspective, all of these were beasts. That just like an animal could be under his control. He can tame them. He can put them away. So God has rule over these nations from the view of Daniel's dream. Is that what you're saying? It is. And I appreciate you saying that because I would have forgotten to mention it. But yes, it was God's plan for Israel to rule as an example to all the world. That was his plan under Solomon and David. But with the bad example they set. Correct. So... He wanted to save his name because Israel was becoming a joke in the nations and therefore their God was becoming a joke to the nation. So he had to do something. But he is going to prove through these visions that even though he's going to tear down Israel, which all the world thought was going to be the next golden mountain, he was going to tear them down for a season, but he was still in charge. And these visions prove that he was still in charge, only that he was now ruling from a different source. That's wonderful. It's faith reaffirming, especially the part that you had mentioned earlier, that Daniel followed a pattern in order to get the answers he needed. Uh, do you mind if we just, as a recap, as, the, uh, as we got to wrap up our episode here, as we just go over what was the pattern Daniel followed in order to receive help from the Lord? You bet. He fasted and prayed. He confessed his sins, and in his case, the sins of the people. So I suppose maybe it would be the sins of our family, maybe, as well and that he knew that the Lord would keep his word, and that he had promised to forgive them when they repented. And the Lord responded. We've now talked about Daniel, who he was, Nebuchadnezzar, his conversion, the great faith of Daniel. What happens next? The fall of Babylon. So we'll get into that on our next episode. And we have a real surprise. Most people don't know that Isaiah actually wrote a letter to Cyrus, the next ruler, 200 years before Cyrus was even born, and Daniel had that letter. Oh, wow. Uh, thank you all for listening. This has been the Gospel Feast podcast. We've been here with author and historian Reed Simonson discussing the lectures and the books that he has written. If you'd like an opportunity to read along with us, these books are available on Amazon and free on Kindle. Thank you for listening. We remind everyone we are not sponsored or involved or endorsed by any denomination. This is just our testimonies and our understanding of the gospel. Thank you, and until our next gospel feast. Music